This is Scott Spears, and I'd like to welcome you to a new edition of Scott Spears Now. Today, the guest, a conservative legend, the lady who defeated the Equal Rights Amendment by her own account. Did she, didn't she? She'll tell us about that. She is the leader of the anti-feminist movement, probably one of the most hated women in America to a lot of women, certainly feminist. She is Phyllis Schlafly. Phyllis Schlafly on the program. Phyllis and I talk about a lot of things. It's a very deep conversation, very entertaining, and sometimes we hit some hot issues, as you'll be able to tell. Phyllis Schlafly, right now on Scott this Spears. This is Scott now. Spears, and today I'm joined by a pioneer in the anti-feminist movement. She's an author, speaker, activist, broadcaster, revolutionary. She's Mrs. Phyllis Schlafly, and we're so glad to have her here today. Phyllis, you're looking oh. great. Hello, it's Scott. Good to tell uh, what you. What type of childhood did you have? Well, I grew up during the Great Depression, and we didn't have any government handouts. I don't think our family ever got a nickel from the government in any type of a handout. My father got laid off, and my brother had to go to work, and, and she ultimately was the librarian at the St. Louis Art Museum for 25 years because she had prepared herself for life before we got married, before she got married. And, and that's what I grew up believing it was my job to do, uh, to get prepared to, to deal with whatever uh, and versus the uh, life dealt me. And so that's what led me into working my way through college. I, um, I took, got a job. I worked a 48-hour week. Uh, I worked half the time, 4 to midnight, and the other half midnight to 8 in the morning, and went to college in the morning at Washington University in St. Louis. And if you wanna know what I did, I tested 30 and 50 caliber ammunition before it was accepted by the government. I fired thousands, tens of thousands of rounds of 30 and 50 caliber ammunition. Mm. You know, Phyllis, something you said there caught my ear. Why do you feel when the Great Depression happened that your mother was able to find work, but after your father was laid off, he wasn't able to find work. Uh, well, um, she's, uh, they, she went for jobs that uh, were supposedly women's jobs. She first got a job um, selling uh, goods in a department store, and then she got a job as a teacher. Most of the teachers were women in those days. And then ultimately, uh, she applied for the job as librarian at the St. Louis Art Museum, for which she was very well qualified. You understand, she got her college degree, a couple of them, in 1920. And uh, feminists did not invent opportunities for women. They were there long before uh, the feminist movement got organized. And, and it's, I'm, I'm sure it was a very uh, interesting coming up, and it, we'll have to uh, talk more about that sometime, but I want to get to some big moments in your life. Uh, question, when you were growing up, what did you want to be watching your mom? What did I want? Yeah, what did you want to be when you grew up, when you were a little child? Well, I'm not somebody who plotted my whole life uh, before uh, I got going with life. I, I, I was one who, who, who took it the way it was handed to me and, and tried to figure out what I was supposed to be doing then. When we came to know as a country, Phyllis Schlafly, 1964 was the big push. Uh, when a chance, not an echo, was published. Why was that published? Uh, it's a choice, not an echo. And uh, it was uh, because uh, one of my hobbies has been Republican national conventions. I have attended every one since 1952. And in 1964, we wanted to nominate Barry Goldwater. 
and I knew that most delegates to a Republican convention are first-timers. They didn't know what went before, and I needed, needed to tell them uh, how crooked it could be and uh, what they could expect. And uh, that's, uh, I, I laid out the fight between the establishment and the grassroots. And uh, that book, A Choice Not an Echo, really helped to invent the conservative movement. And it was played a big role in getting Barry Goldwater nominated in 1964. Why do you feel it became so popular? Because it, it unlike most um, political uh, writing, it really persuaded people. It took people who were for Lyndon Johnson and turned them into Barry Goldwater conservatives. It took people who were for Nelson Rockefeller and converted them into conservatives, supporting a conservative grassroots candidate like Barry Goldwater. And they saw this happen. So people would buy uh, 100 or 200 books, distribute them in their neighborhood, and then they would be able to re-canvas the neighborhood and find that they were converted by the book A Choice Not an Echo. I've had all kinds of prominent Republicans today tell me that they came into the conservative movement when even at age 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, reading A Choice Not an Echo. Hmm. Uh, uh, Phyllis, one of the big pushes of your life, I believe, if, if they know nothing else about Phyllis Schlafly, they know that you oppose the Equal Rights Amendment. Why did you do that? Because it was a fraud. It um, wouldn't do anything for women. It was presented as something that would give women the new rights and opportunities. It wouldn't do anything for women. In fact, the word in the Equal Rights Amendment was not women at all. It was sex. It would put sex in the Constitution. So we know perfectly well now that if it had been ratified, we would have had same-sex marriage 25 years ago. You know, it's very interesting, Phyllis. Uh, the word that I used to introduce you was anti-feminist, and that's become a tag that's been put on you for many years. Uh, to you, what is a feminist? Um, well, I've written extensively on what is a feminist, and a feminist is somebody who is anti-family, who believes that women are victims of the patriarchy, and they want to abolish the patriarchy. That's the bottom line. They hate full-time homemakers above all. They want to get rid of them, get them all out of the home. Their leader, Betty Friedan, called the home a comfortable concentration camp. And uh, I think the feminists are the most destructive movement in our country today, and they've done a, a good job of trying to kill the family. Does killing the family and being destructive essentially mean getting the woman out of the home? Should the woman be in the home? Well, they want to get her out of the home, absolutely. They're, they're very above board about that. They, they make no uh, a, a concealment about that. And um, they, they look upon uh, society's expectation that a mother look after her and care for her own children as an example of the oppression of women by the patriarchy. So you can see they have been working ceaselessly to have the government take over the raising of children in every way, uh, all kinds of uh, daycare programs uh, to uh, turn it over to the taxpayers. I want to bring this up, uh, Phyllis, because I, I got the definition of feminist as it appears in a dictionary. Uh, a collection of movements and ideologies aimed at defining uh, and establishing equal political, economic, and social rights of women. Do you like that definition? No, that, that could apply when the dictionaries were written 50 years ago. Uh, the, the women who, for example, fought for... Uh, well, women's suffrage, uh, they could have called themselves feminists, and they, that, could, uh, that definition could have applied to them. But the modern uh, feminist movement, uh, beginning in uh, the, uh, 1969 with the divorce law and the 1970s with their push for ERA, is absolutely not for equality. It is for interchangeability. 
and it is for abolishing the patriarchy, and it is for getting all the wives out of the home into the workforce. When most people hear the word feminist, above all else, above everything else, the main thing that people bring up, main issue, is that women should be paid the same as men. Do you believe in that? Because that's still not equal in this country. No, I don't believe women should be paid the same as men. I think women should be paid the same as men if they do equal work, but not if they don't do equal work. That's what the law says, and that's been the law since about 1963. And if, if you're not uh, getting uh, that kind of a deal, you've got a whole government bureau and all kinds of government lawyers who are ready to take your case. And, and I think we'll leave that part of this at what that. What do you make I, of the birther movement that went on during the elections with Obama, saying he's not an American citizen? Well, I haven't really studied that, and uh, I, uh, I, I think it's very strange that we know less about Obama's uh, private life than anybody who's ever been president. I'd like to see his grades at Columbia and uh, uh, Harvard Law School, because uh, nobody believes he had the grades to get into those schools. Phyllis, what do you make of women today in high, or I'm going to say college, women out of high school? Last year it was just reported that fewer babies were born than ever before since the history of, of baby records in 1903. Um, women are getting married later. Women want to have careers. What do you make of young women today? Well, that's what the schools are teaching them. The schools are teaching them from the elementary grades, how to engage in sex. When they go to college, they are invited to join the hookup generation. Uh, the women's studies uh, courses uh, tell them uh, to plan a life that has no space for marriage or babies. And we're getting this propaganda all the time. And a lot of them believe it. And uh, of course, the whole uh, abortion uh, argument is to give uh, women uh, control over um, uh, sex and marriage and babies and everything else and, uh, and men. And uh, it's, uh, the whole thing is anti-family anti and anti-children. It's uh, very unfortunate. We have a 41% illegitimacy right now, and I think that's shocking. And one, one of the other things that uh, we need to address is um, uh, the incentives that are used with government money uh, to promote illegitimacy. Uh, the, these handouts, these 79 different types of welfare handouts, which have been identified by the uh, Heritage Foundation, uh, simply promote illegitimacy because uh, they give more a woman has babies without a husband, she turns to big brother government, and he makes it easy for her. Phyllis, what Phyllis. should women be taught in schools? What is the goal, do you believe, for a young woman? To, to be a wife, to be a mother, to be at home, to have a career? Is it a choice? What is it? Well, I, I don't think that's up to the school to decide or to impose on women or anybody else. I think they ought to teach them the, uh, how to read. That's another one of my particular projects. It's just shocking that this uh, country allows people to go through 12 years of school and never learn how to read. And that's because of the first great effort to take over uh, a public school education by abolishing the teaching of phonics. And if you don't learn phonics in the first grade, you're not going to know how to read. And that's what's happened to our country. So they can't read anything important. They haven't read any important uh, books or, or the history of our country. They, they're very ignorant about American history. And uh, I think the schools ought to be interested in teaching reading, writing, math, some science, history. And uh, that's your job. It's not to teach kids about sex. 
Do you believe if sex education was taken out of the schools that possibly the birth rate would increase because people would not have protected or safe sex? Uh, well, I don't know. I can't predict on that. But, but I do think the explicit sex ed is, uh, uh, shreds the kids of their modesty and encourages them to have sex at a very early age. I want to throw some names at you, Phyllis, and just give me a thumbnail sketch of your personal feeling on the person, starting with President Barack Obama. I think he's been a disaster for our country. I think every, everything he's done has been harmful to our country and its future. George W. Bush. Uh, George W. Bush was a terrible disappointment. Uh, he really was a globalist, is a globalist. Uh, he uh, tried to, uh, uh, well, he tried to give us open borders with Canada and Mexico. He tried all kinds of globalist initiatives, and they are a disaster. Rush Limbaugh. I think Rush, Rush Limbaugh is the best authentic conservative in the country today. Speaker of the House John Boehner. Uh, Boehner's a terrible disappointment in that he uh, doesn't uh, fight um, the Obama uh, efforts uh, with the energy that he should. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, politics is a very competitive sport, and we are disappointed that uh, he's uh, gone along with Obama in too many cases. For example, he went to the White House, and in one little visit with Obama, he agreed with him about bombing Syria. That's ridiculous. We didn't want another war. Obama's already given us too many wars. Do, how many wars do you feel George W. Bush gave us? Because he gets that laid on him a lot. How many what? Wars do you believe George W. Bush... Oh. Uh, well, well, he he gave us uh, Iraq, um, but then Obama. When Obama got there, he declared that Afghanistan was his war. He kind of relieved uh, uh, Bush of uh, any authorship of Afghanistan, and Afghanistan has been a total disaster. A land. Oh. So I uh, the this whole idea that that we can impose a democracy in the Middle East uh, and, and, and teach them to have a, a democratic form of government is, is, is just nuts. I don't know how any rational person could believe that that is within our capability. A lady who many people feel is going to be the Democratic uh, nominee for president next time around, former First Lady Hillary Clinton. Your thoughts on well, that? Well, she's, she's running for president, no question about that. I don't think this country is ready to elect her, but she is running. Would you support a female president on the Republican side? Well, it doesn't make any difference to me whether she's male or female. It makes a difference to me whether uh, she's a, a conservative or a globalist. Uh, Phyllis, I want to bring up a couple things here as we approach the end of the interview. You know, in everybody's life, some things happen. We all know that. Uh, and I wanted to just, just address a few of these things. In March 2007, uh, you gave a quote that got a lot of press at the time. Uh, the quote was, by getting married, the woman has consented to sex, and I don't think you can call it rape. Do you stand by that? Well, of course, that's what getting married means. What if the... Getting married means you, you are picking your partner to have sex with and build a life with, for better, for worse, till death do us part. I think the reason people got angry about that was because if you're married and the husband forces you to have sex, is that rape? Unconsensual. Um... We have laws in every state against uh, any type of physical attack, uh, assault, battery, forcing people to do things they don't want to do. And those laws 
should be um, enforced. Uh, marriage does not give a man an attempt to uh, physically force his wife to do anything. So, but you wouldn't call it rape. Even I would, you know, well, the feminists invented this term of spousal rape. It's only come in in the last uh, about 20 years. Uh, I, 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 I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I just think that a lot of people get angry because I think there have been cases when a, a wife has been attacked by a husband and forced to have sex. Uh, an assault is not forcing to have sex. I guess you could throw it under assault, but why can't you call that rape? Well, that was invented about 20 years ago. I mean, we, this, this country's lived a long time without calling it rape. And I don't know that that... And, and the other thing is um, the political prosecutions. I, I think uh, um, you, you run into a lot of other problems. I, I think if a man... Um, it, it does something that is uh, physically harmful to the woman, uh, he should be punished. And I think people will be glad to hear you say that, because I think sometime that quote gets turned around. Uh, in 2008, you were awarded an honorary degree uh, from the university in St. Louis. And a lot of people were angry about that uh, because of they felt what you stand for. And you said basically you didn't care about those people who didn't care. But my question is, why do you feel people have such a, a strong aversion to you? Well, I don't think there were many people who were opposed to me or critical of me on that. Uh, the, the demonstration and the opposition was led by the feminist professors in the Washington University Law School. And uh, I think they uh, you ask, why did they hate me so much? And I finally decided it wasn't because I defeated the Equal Rights Amendment. It was because I stood up for the full-time homemaker. And that is the person the feminists hate the most, next to the patriarchy, of course. Uh, and so they read it. And it was clear from that day at the commencement. And what they did was to uh, hurt the commencement for a couple of thousand kids who were graduating that day, most of whom didn't have any idea who I am. And uh, all, of the, uh, all of the people on the radio and television in the St. Louis area all supported me on that. It was just nastiness of the feminist faculty in the law school. What? And you know, I think one of them, I took her course in family law and they have more engraving at the Washington uh, University Law School, and uh, I gave her back all our feminist propaganda on the, on the exam, and I got a great grade from her, and she's probably still mad about it <laughs> when she found out who she gave such a good grade to. Uh, Phyllis, I, uh, we've talked about this, and it all comes back to feminism. I mean, that's the big tag word here. I think that the most destructive element in our society today. Right, and I, I understand that, but I'm, I'm confused on, on this. When you say that their main enemy was the homemaker, the full-time homemaker, feminism, you, you can't force somebody to leave the home. You can present the idea of why you should leave the home, but you can't force somebody to leave the home just as if you can't force somebody to go to work. So, Phyllis, is it your personal opinion that the best life is as a homemaker or that I, I'm confused on what the, the homemaker, I understand why you feel the feminists are angry at the homemaker, but is that the ideal life in your opinion, the homemaker? Is it the ideal life? Life. Is that the way to go? Oh, sure. I do think it's the ideal life. If it's not for you, well, that's okay with me. You don't have to get my permission to not be a homemaker. Um, but the, uh, the, the feminists, uh, and, uh, let me tell you how they're forcing her out of the home. For one thing, they're all the way through school and college. Uh, they are taught to plan a life that uh, doesn't include being a homemaker. They want to plan a life that doesn't include marriage and children. They are taught that children ought to be taken care of by daycare centers, not by mothers. They are taught that it is demeaning 
for an educated woman to take care of her own children. This is the teaching that's going on every day in our colleges and high schools. That's one element. Um, another element is the family courts, which uh, are, are, are so anti any father and any any family and are breaking up marriages all the time uh, the the divorce laws that the feminists put through enables a woman to walk out on marriage anytime she wants it's just as simple as checking a box saying i'm out of here it used to be you had to show some fault with the other party to get a divorce now you just say to lou i'm out of here and uh the, then there are the incentives for illegitimacy they're paid for by our tax dollars. Uh, they, 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 it, it, it be, uh, much becomes more profitable to have illegitimate kids and get handouts from the government than it is to get married. You, you know, Phyllis, uh, your mother left the home because your father had lost his job. You said the depression taught you and your mother by example that you needed something to fall back on in life. Isn't there something to be said that the reason women are leaving the home isn't necessarily the teaching of the feminist, but because the wage is so low all around that you need two incomes to support a home nowadays? Well, that's the, the other cause of the problem with the homemaker that I didn't get time to mention, and that is free trade. Free trade has been the, the best friend of the feminists because what they've done is shipped millions of the good, well-paying, blue-collar jobs over to China, the $50,000 jobs and the automobile plants and so forth. And when the man has to take a job at a minimum wage at Starbucks, he cannot support a full-time homemaker. So free trade has been a great ally of the feminists. And, uh, it's, it's extremely unfortunate. Before, though, the free trade with China, back in the Depression, as I say, back to your personal situation, because your father was laid off, your mother had to go uh, to work because there was no government assistance program like unemployment to help your father. raise it. So your mother had to go do something that maybe she would not have done if your father had not been laid off. So I guess the question again then, back in those days, in the 1930s and 40s, uh, why were women leaving the home? I mean, it, it still happened, even though free trade was not the cause, it was the depression. It was, it was bad. Depression. Yeah, so causes can happen, I think. Well, how you deal with uh, life with the way it comes to you? We had to eat. That's right, and I think that's the way some people feel today that they have to eat. Now, you, it could be caused by free trade, but, you know, people die, unfortunately. People get sick, cancer. Um, there are a lot of reasons people aren't working. Yeah, I'm sure. That's right. And not necessarily the feminist that's causing the homemaker to go into the workforce. That's right. There are all kinds, there are all kinds of different reasons. People make different choices. That's what you can do. And if are you as equally angry at those reasons as the feminist? Um, well, I don't know what reasons. If, if, if uh, uh, Obama's uh, plans uh, and his policies that have given us this high unemployment, sure, I am mad about that. Do you think any of that was due to George W. Bush or policies before, or is it all Obama, 100%? Well, most of it's Obama, but I, I'm not a big fan of George W. Bush. I think he, um, he was a New World Order, the globalist type, and that was not good for American jobs or uh, American national defense. Phyllis, years from now, how would you like to be remembered? You're certainly going to be remembered. You have your page in history. How do you want to be remembered? Uh, well, I think the most significant thing is that I showed that a grassroots organization that had no political backing could be the entire establishment. When we fought the Equal Rights Amendment, we had everybody against us. Three presidents, all the governors, most of the Congress, Hollywood, 
uh, all kinds of uh, uh, people, the media, 99% uh, of the media, and, uh, and not even much of the conservative movement, because nobody thought we could win, and we beat them all. And that's my, that's my lesson to people today. Uh, organize and, and Questions get I want to get in, Phyllis, because I know once this interview airs that there will be women, and it's mostly women, not a lot of men. Women will, they have an anger towards you. And we talked about why they have this anger. Do you fully understand why they're angry? You don't have to agree with them, but do you understand why you are such a polarizing figure to women? Not men, really, women. Well, the ones who are angry are the feminists. Uh, uh, feminism teaches them to be angry because feminism teaches women to be victims. If you wake up in the morning and you think you're a victim of society, uh, you're not going to be happy, and uh, you probably are not going to accomplish anything. And, and I think that's very unfortunate. Uh, my, my family and I never thought we were victims. We thought we should work hard and do our best, and, and uh, that's the way uh, we would make our lives. And uh, uh, it, it's just very unfortunate what, how feminism makes women uh, feel unhappy, feel victims, feel angry. But, but it, I, I would not accuse all women of being uh, angry. Uh, it's the feminist group that is making the noise and has tremendous access to the media for whatever they want to say or do. I would say, Phyllis, that a lot of feminists, I think Hillary Clinton would consider herself a feminist. I think a lot of the female politicians would say that, certainly on the Democratic side. Uh, a lot of show business people say that. Um, Gloria Steinem, certainly can't forget her. I wouldn't say these are people who haven't accomplished something, because I think, uh, take Gloria Steinem out of there because her, her whole thing was the feminist movement, but those actresses, those politicians who have got to the highest form of government, I think they have accomplished something, even though they call themselves feminist. And since the rise of the feminist movement, since the creation of it, we do have more women in government than ever before. We have more women in higher earning positions. How do you account for that? Well, I've encouraged women to be active in politics all my life. That's one of the things I've been doing. And I've encouraged many of them to do that. But the interesting thing about the feminists is that they don't really believe women can be successful. Uh, they would be uh, holding up as, uh, as role models people like Sarah Palin. Now, whether you like it or not, she is extremely successful. Successful as a wife, successful as a politician, uh, successful in whatever she's done. And they can't stand her. She's a whipping boy. Uh, they, they would be telling you about how great Margaret Thatcher was. Tremendous woman who said she didn't know a thing to, to women's live, but she was uh, maybe uh, one of the two most important women in British history. And uh, they, they don't believe women can be successful because they are held down by the patriarchy. And that's just a very unfortunate thing for women to believe. I, I know all kinds of successful women. And I've encouraged many of them to be in politics. But I can tell you, I, ha I have run for office. And there are never going to be as many women who want to go down that road as men. Because it's a dog's life. I don't wish it on anybody. I, I just think you know, we have to, some of us have to do it as our duty to try to make this a better country. But it's not an easy path. And uh, you'll never get as many women who want to do that as men. Uh, Sarah Palin, for example, you, you brought her up there, so I don't want to let this pass. Sarah Palin certainly has become a success. Whether you like her or dislike her, I think you have to say she's successful. But do you think that Sarah Palin would have had the ability to run for governor of the state of Alaska if women were not coming out of the home? She had to come out of the home to do that. She was in television before uh, her, her political career. She had a career. Well, I, I don't think she came out of the home. She's got a neat husband who's supported her all the way. Oh, 
so if you have the husband who supports you, it's not necessary to be in the home. That's not what you're saying. Well, who's counting the hours? I, I mean, <laughs> children grow up. Uh, uh, home, homemakers are not uh, uh, chained to the to the to the washing machine. But I, uh, there are a lot of there are all kinds of other hours of the day, and most homemakers have time to have hobbies. I always looked upon politics as my hobby. I would. Uh, Sarah Palin's an interesting case because I think her youngest child was not even in school when she was governor, and certainly I don't even think was in school yet when um, she ran for uh, or became vice presidential nominee. Her oldest daughter at the time was unmarried and pregnant under the age of 18. But you look to Sarah Palin as a good role model anti-feminist. Why? Because it seems that her... It isn't what I said. I said by any standard, she is a success. And, and it's success that feminists do not believe women can achieve because they're held down by the patriarchy and they need all these government helps such as affirmative action and, and extra legislation for this, that, and the other thing. But would you also call Hillary Clinton a success? Would you call people who consider themselves feminist? Yes, she's a success. Okay. I, I'm just curious because of a lot of the things we've talked about, uh, the unmarried and pregnant and the uh, young children still at home, Sarah Palin was having her career while this was going on. Do you believe, because you certainly have made the equation, that not having a mother at home, a homemaker, certainly could lead to the children going astray? Having a child under 18, I think, would be in most people's minds something astray. Do you think maybe that's a reason, her? <laughs> Have uh, a very strange idea about a full-time homemaker. I have not held any paid job since I got married. But uh, the first time I ran for public office, it, it was because the party asked me to do it. They they really thought it was a, a hopeless run, but anyway, they asked me to do it. And I had uh, I had a child who was uh, just I don't know a couple years old. But but the, but it was a a, a a district of only two counties. And I could go out and give a speech and come home. I was never gone overnight. So, but it was a very public and much reported to race. Uh, but uh, I certainly was a full time homemaker. I mean, this idea that the full time homemaker can't have any uh, ideas or hobbies or other things she wants to do is just kind of ridiculous. Okay, I, and this leads me to the final question, and I have enjoyed this conversation, really, Phyllis. I hope you have as well, because I think the, the conversation of ideas is important. And the final question here today, because a lot of people have said this, they feel, Phyllis, that your life is a bit of a paradox, because you have fought for the, fought under the banner of anti-feminism, uh, you became very well known on the public level for uh, being anti-feminist, fighting the Equal Rights Amendment, but yet you have certainly had a career. You do public speaking engagements, you have run for office, you, have, you head up an organization now, uh, part of the, the Eagle Forum, you give broadcasts, you've written newsletters. Not everything you've done has been in the home. So they think there's a bit of a paradox there. Do you see that paradox? No. They don't, they don't understand what life's all about. Um, I, I always had a supporting husband. In fact, my favorite joke when I talked to the college uh, campuses was I want to thank my husband, Fred, for letting me come here tonight. And, oh, you could always tell who the feminists were. They didn't laugh. They have no sense of humor. Um, but uh, in, in any event... Um, there are all kinds of things I can do, but you, you have to realize I'm a hard worker. Now just think about this for a minute. I don't know what people do in their spare time in college today. When I went to college, I worked a 48 hour week. It took me one hour each way to get out to where I worked and back. 
at the same time that I carried a full college course and graduated in three years. Now, that tells you I know how to make the best use of my time. And so I was able to do uh, a lot of things, more things in the same amount of time than a lot of other people could. And that does not diminish my role as a loving wife of Fred Schlafly and mother of six children. Well, Phyllis, I really, like I say again, I have enjoyed the conversation quite a bit. I hope that uh, when things come up that we can come back and talk about them in the future because I certainly think you're an important part of American history. And as I say, you certainly have written your page. And I do thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us. Goodbye. Thank you. Phyllis Schlafly. Phyllis Schlafly. What an interesting lady she is. We didn't see eye to eye on everything, but who does? And I certainly hope Phyllis comes back in the future because she is an interesting person to talk to. If you have any comments about this episode, you can email me at osukid2006 at aol.com. Join the discussion on Facebook by searching Scott Spears now. But until next time, for me, Scott Spears, and the conservative activist Phyllis Schlafly, we're headed for the dugout.